Taking off from Nilakantha Shastri's History of South India ends, this book tells the tale of many, many characters that shaped the course of South Indian history. To Rani Chennamma, to courtesans like Bangalore Nagaratnamma, from writers like Vemana to Gurzada Parao, uh, and Dravidian politicians, uh, and from politicians like Periyar, to died in the world communists like EMS Namudiri Pad. This book covers all of these and many more such characters. A masterpiece of research and historical biography, the narrative is structured around the history of Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, and Kannada speaking peoples in South India. Uh, straddling four cultural strands that emerge as distinct entities and a 400 year period is a majestic achievement, one that will further our achievement of South Indian history. So I'd like to start off by asking uh, uh, Mr. Rajmohan Gandhi what led to this book and why did it take so many years after Nilakanta Shastri's uh, book uh, for such a comprehensive history of modern South India to emerge? Nilakanta Shastri's uh, book was about ancient South India. Yeah. And you're quite right that in the mid 50s after that, uh, nobody else has attempted quite, I think one or two have, but uh, uh, why others did not attempt the, this task, I cannot quite answer, of course. But it was something that uh, was not, not attempted. And the reason I did it was A, my publisher, David David R. asked me if I would do this. And secondly, uh, the fact that I am half a South Indian uh, also influenced this. And I was very curious to understand South India for myself. Uh, I knew a little bit about the Tamil part, not enough of, uh, and I had superficial acquaintance with other parts to, uh, through a variety of uh, interactions and involvements. But I, so above all, I wanted to understand South India for myself and also to understand uh, the Telugu part, the Kannada part, the Malayalam part, and if possible, the Tulu and the Konkani and the other parts also. I, I wanted to ask that this book runs on, on four parallel tracks, as you described, the, the Telugu part, the Kannada part, and so on. Um, there is an early passage in the book where you cite a historian of medieval Andhra saying that there is a clear consciousness of affiliation with a uh, regional language and a particular identity. But then yeah. you also say that, uh, uh, the, uh, you cite another scholar, Sheldon Pollock, and say that there is no evidence for linguism uh, before modernity and in this period. And so what do you think marks the critical point where modernity, where uh, these distinct linguistic identities emerge in modern South India? Uh, that's, uh, yes, so let me, yes. Uh, this uh, Cynthia Talbot, who is a very good, uh, amazing historian of the, of the Telugu part, uh, has made her assessment that even in the uh, 15th, 16th centuries, uh, there was a very strong uh, affiliation with language and that people were proud to be affiliated to their language. And Sheldon Pollock has said that uh, people were carriers of language and that, ling that linguism was not a political force. Um, so uh, I think that that is a, a, a a reasonable statement that Pollock makes. So if we look at the 17th or 18th centuries, uh, we find uh, uh, languages, uh, the literature growing and people being attached to the language, but we don't find politics revolving around language in the 17th or 18th centuries at all. The politics revolved around uh, who, the, who the chief was, who the Nayaka was, uh, who the local chief was. <coughs> and of course, as everybody who has here this evening knows, South India was not ruled by Delhi or from North India during the 17th, 18th centuries at all. And, uh, so, but it was not ruled by a single entity either. So there were various rulers, some large, some small, and the uh, rulerships were changing. The political balance uh, was also changing. It was a very turbulent period. But as far as one can figure out in the 17th and 18th, 19th centuries even, politics did not revolve around language, but language was certainly a very important factor in people's lives. Is, is there a, a singular moment where that transition happens in the 
with uh, before the Dravidian movement where the linguistic consciousness arises? So I would say that uh, the linguistic consciousness uh, arose very much uh, in tandem with the independence movement. Okay. Uh, yes. So, uh, and the, uh, and as you, as uh, many here may know, uh, that those who were involved in the independence movement also were conscious of this. And so uh, Gandhi and the others from 1915, 1916, 1917, uh, recognized uh, the great importance people attached to the language. So these provincial Congress committees were formed along linguistic lines. So there was an Andhra Pradesh Congress committee much before, years, years, decades before Andhra was formed. And there was a Kerala Congress. And there was a Tamil Congress. There was a Karnataka Congress. So I would say that it is from the 1910s, 1915s uh, that the linguistic, the political importance of, of, of language was recognized. So one of the interesting things that your book does is that it co covers, it integrates literature into history and is also a sort of literary and cultural history of the period. There's a great dis a deal of discussion about literary figures, about writers and so on. Um, uh, since this is the Hyderabad Literary Festival and a number of our listeners would be interested in the history of uh, the evolution of characters in Telugu literature, you have a passage that discusses the role of Francis White Ellis and his Telugu Dubashes uh, in, in the creation of the Dravid what is called the Dravidian Proof now. Um, could you take us yeah. through that passage? Sure. So uh, uh, when the... Uh, East India Company formed its very strong base in South India, in Madras. Uh, Fort St. George was established in 1639. And I, so these Dubashes, those who uh, knew more than one language, uh, were crucial elements from the very beginning. And to, to begin with, they were more or less equal partners with the British. A Dubash like Timanna, who helped to acquire the land for Fort St. George. Uh, was a very influential man, and subsequent Dubashes also were extremely influential. It was much later that this equality between Indians and the British uh, disappeared, and uh, the British became rulers, and Indians became subservient, and so forth. Uh, so to begin with, the Dubashes, uh, both because of their uh, linguistic skills and their other skills, their courage, their, their uh, opportunism, their enterprise, and their financial uh, resources, some of them. So they, they were extremely influential people. And, and then uh, there was this question of the different languages of the South. And when the British, uh, of course, they were also all over India. They were in, in Calcutta, was became their headquarters. And I think it was somewhere in Calcutta that it was discovered uh, by uh, several people that uh, there was this great commonness between uh, Sanskrit and Latin and Greek. So there was something common between some Indian ling linguistic roots and European. And then the question arose uh, when uh, the British were in South India, ruling, trying to rule there. Uh, they wanted their, of their officers to, to learn local languages. Uh, so there was a study of local languages. And then some very remarkable uh, both British scholars and some Indian scholars examined this, whether Telugu, uh, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil were uh, connected to Sanskrit in a fundamental way. Uh, if not, what was their linguistic origin history? And so they discovered, A, that these South Indian languages had a great deal of a great deal in common with one another, and not so much in common with Sanskrit, although many of them did use Sanskrit words. And they discovered also that they had a separate history altogether. And this man called uh, Ellis, uh, supported by, uh, uh, let me see if I can get their names now. Uh, two Telugu Pandits, I think. Two Telugu Pandits, yes, I, I just wanted to get, get their names here. Uh, it will just take me uh, a while here. I, I want to be sure that I get the names right. Oh dear. So, uh, 
Yes. So, uh, yes, there were there was Patapiram Shastri and Shankaraya. These were two outstanding uh, Dubashes, Telugu scholars, who were working with the British. And so they discovered that uh, 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 that when uh, uh, when Sanskrit and English passages were translated into Tamil, Telugu, and Kannada, the southern languages were similar in idiom and in syntax, their words were akin, and they were strung into sentences in a like manner in the different South Indian languages. So this was a very major uh, discovery. And uh, so, uh, and, and a more modern scholar, this Thomas Troutman, uh, who's a wonderful scholar of, of South Indian languages, and he has uh, established that the research of Patabiram Shastri and Shankaraya was as crucial as that of Ellis, who of course has been recognized as one of the original discoverers of the Dravidian origin of the South Indian languages. So compared to uh, the interaction that was uh, that Ellis and Patabi Ramashastri had, yeah. uh, you also have uh, a, a case where the Telugu Pandits, uh, when it comes to Vemana and C.P. Brown, they constantly yeah. try to eliminate Vemana from the Telugu canon. Uh, this is something so, that yes. you, you comment about and you quote, uh, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Narla uh, and his thoughts about how until the yes. 20th century that omission kept happening. Yes, I think uh, this, uh, the history of Vemana is a very important uh, part of, uh, of, of, of element in this, in this uh, effort of mine. And uh, it is true that for a long time, Vemana was not recognized. And it was only when uh, C.R. Reddy uh, appeared, and I, let me see when that was exactly. Uh, the 1920s? Yes. Uh, you see, you are more familiar with my book than I am. <laughs> yes, 19, 1914, when 34-year-old uh, C. Ramalinga Reddy, who would gain emin eminence in education politics, demanded a place of honor for, for women. And uh, it's, it, it's quite true that uh, when this remarkable man, Charles Philip Brown, uh, you know, there's a, he's very highly honored. There's a memorials for him in Kadapa. So, uh, so he discovered, he was one of the first to go and locate all these uh, uh, manuscripts of, of Vemana's verses. They were, they were still, they were used by many people, but the actual texts were not available. Uh, and it was this man, uh, Charles Philip Brown, who, who discovered these. And, uh, so he, he, he got 500 copies of his verses of Vemana printed by the College of the East India Company in, in Madras. Uh, 50 copies were given to Brown, the author, or the, the collector, but the remaining 450 disappeared. So uh, he discovered that these were in, in the back room of the College of the East India Company in Madras, and rolled up as waste paper, evidently, they had ended up there in that back room with the active connivance of the high caste pundits of the college board. So uh, uh, I, Brown, of course, uh, discovered uh, and made these things available. Uh, and earlier, this remarkable man, uh, Du Bois, uh, who was uh, in the Telugu, in, in, in the Canada area and in the Tamil areas in the South, he had discovered yeah. that Vermana was very well known in different parts of the South, that his verses had been translated into other South Indian languages. So that is how, what made uh, Charles Philip Brown go and search for these. And so, but yes, there is this history of suppression of Vemana for some time, uh, but ultimately the sheer power of Vemana's verses, uh, which uh, everybody who is in Hyderabad would be familiar with. And, but, uh, but it is interesting that uh, it, it took this, uh, this uh, Englishman or Britain to make Vemana again available to all over South India. Uh, shifting to a more uh, modern period, one of the characters that stands out very strongly in your book is your grandfather, uh, uh, Razaji, uh, where specifically um, uh, he describes himself as the snake charmer of uh, British imperialism. I, I love that one uh, phrase. But uh, the, in the entire period preceding independence until 72, he is one of the 
uh, the main figures in the book and you talk ex uh, in great detail about his friendship and simultaneous animosity with Periyar and you contrast the two of them. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the relationship that uh, Razazi and Periyar sh uh, shared? Uh, well, yes, that too is, a, I think, an interesting part of the study. And uh, of course, Periyar and Rajaji, uh, their interaction, their, their frequent friendships and partnerships, their more frequent uh, conflicts and, and, and uh, disagreements, uh, that forms a very uh, fascinating part, at least to me, and I think to many others of the story. Um, and as people may know or may not know, that they both joined uh, the Indian National Movement uh, very actively in the 1990, 1920, 1921. Uh, they both had a very active role uh, in the Vaikam anti untouchability movement in, in, in the Malayalam country in 1924. And she, they, but thereafter, their paths diverged, uh, and uh, Periyar became this great uh, iconoclast this, who felt that uh, more important than the independence, political independence movement, was a social justice for. Uh, people he felt had been very badly treated for centuries. Uh, so, uh, but their friend, friendship continued. So, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I do uh, touch on several aspects of that friendship, including a very curious uh, uh, invitation that uh, Periyar extended to CR Rajaji uh, uh, when Periyar wanted uh, another marriage in his life. He wanted Rajaji as the, as the sole witness of that marriage. So in, in this very deeply personal ma aspect of his life, he wanted to involve Rajaji, who by this time had become governor general. So yes, I agree. That is a, one of the fascinating elements of the story that I found. Now, that particular episode where uh, he asked him to be the witness to his uh, marriage, um, do you think that was done to confer legitimacy on the marriage or what, what, what led to that? I don't know. I, I, you know, you know I, I, I can't enter into Periyar's mind. I'm not a close enough student of Periyar's own life that, that, that way to understand why he might have done that. But I would say that his personal friendship uh, was an important element in this. And he wanted an old personal friend to be there. Uh, and, but it is also true, as, as scholars of South Indian history know, that that marriage of Periyar was a factor in the uh, departure of so many from the DK, and that's how the DMK got established. So there was a very big political element also uh, connected to that second marriage of Periyar's. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, that uh, C.R. Razazi was uh, an obstinate character, and once he made a decision about something, um, such as uh, the imposition of Hindi and so on, he, he did not go back on that. Uh, but in our, there's an uh, interesting passage where you talk about his role in the, um, in, uh, the annexation of Hyderabad, the state when the Nizam does not uh, uh, acquiesce. Of course, he had to play a crucial role because he was the governor general at the time. And uh, you know, until there was a change in Hyderabad's uh, status, the governor general was the contact with the Nizam of Hyderabad. So the, he had to be involved. There was Nehru, the prime minister. There was uh, Patel, the home minister. And there was uh, CR, the governor general. All three were involved in this action. Uh, and yes, that, is, that again is a, is a very interesting part of the story. Yeah. Um, so that that period uh, was uh, characterized by both simultaneously the emergence of this uh, pan-South Indian Dravidanadu concept by Periyar, which never really took off, but also the the separate the separation and creation of, like you said earlier, uh, Pradesh Congress committees and so on. Um, but you say in your book that the last time South India's political leaders acted in concert and worked towards unity was uh, when Kamraj, Neelam, Sanjeeva Reddy and Nizlingappa tried to uh, apply the brakes uh, on Mrs. Gandhi. Um, yeah. in, in, uh, but you say otherwise that that solidarity in the South remains an elusive concept. What, uh, what do you think uh, of it uh, going forward? Yes. Uh, incidentally, uh, you know, here I should uh, point out, uh, underline the fact that uh, my attempt is not to provide answers to questions that people may ask today. Why did this happen? Why did this not happen? It is to try and render as faithful an account of what was happening as it was happening. 
So that is yeah. you know, the main purpose. So uh, it is true, as I found, that there was on the one hand a South Indian feeling throughout. You know, uh, there was a sense that South India was different from North India, it was distinct from North India. This was recognized. <coughs> Moreover, uh, the Telugus, the Tamils, the Kannadas, the Malayalis, and the others were neighbors to one another. But whereas there was a feeling that the North sometimes doesn't treat us well, that New Delhi or even national leaders of the International Congress tend to ignore South India as a whole, this was widely shared. But the real knowledge and understanding of fellow South Indians was very limited. So this is one of the running threads that emerges. There is, yes, there is a recognition of South India as a distinct cultural entity, distinct geographical entity, but not a sufficient understanding of your neighboring South India. And so this, this is, a, I think, a continuing reality today. Even today, in today's politics, if I may move away from history to, to, to today's situation, uh, the, yes, there is a difference in, in the way South Indians think about India as a whole, about many political questions, but even today, this understanding of and, and, and readiness to, to establish real solidarity and partnership with your neighboring South Indian cultural entity or South Indian state, that is very, very insufficient and has been. So some of the other characters that make their appearance in, 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 in your book are uh, literary figures like uh, Saminata Iyer, and mm -hmm. how the, that led to a revival of uh, uh, the rediscovery of an ancient past. Um, figures that appear on the periphery are uh, the, uh, uh, the founder of the pure Tamil movement, Marai uh, Malay Adigal, and mm -hmm. others uh, that uh, appear. Uh, in, yeah. uh, and they propound, uh, at least uh, the pure Tamil movement propounded a very Shaivite conception of uh, um, things. So how did they fit in in the uh, story of independence? Well, that's a very important strand in the story. Incidentally, UVS, whom you mentioned, of course, an incredible yeah. figure, the Tamil Tata, <laughs> the uh, grandfather Tamil, who is widely known. But, uh, you know, Venkat Chalapati, there was a great scholar in today, uh, who is working and has been working for some time on Periyar's biography. I don't know when that will appear. But uh, Venkat Chalapati points out that even before UVS uh, recovered some of these texts, uh, two uh, Tamils in Sri Lanka uh, had, had done something quite remarkable. And they also had a Shaivite background. But, you know, I, so I don't go into the Shaivite, uh, non-Shaivite, uh, uh, whether there are differences, what are the similarities, uh, what are the political implications. That is not a great focus on my study, but I do bring out this element. And yes, uh, this, uh, this question also appears every now and then in the Dravidian movement too. Yeah. There, uh, there is a passage where UVS uh, goes to meet someone, I think in uh, uh, Mr. Mudalyar, and he asks him, what have you read? Uh, in Kumbakonam, yes. In Kumbakonam, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, this UV, when UVS was a very young man and a brilliant scholar, and he was interested in Tamil literature, but this other, I mean, Aksi Sundaram Pillai, who was a remarkable man, on, and whose biography then uh, UVS wrote. But uh, Meenakshi Sundaram Pillai is the one who uh, uh, brought to UVS's attention the existence of these extraordinary ancient uh, texts, which then UVS uh, went out and discovered. So that, that is, again, this was related uh, by UVS in his uh, autobiography. And it, of course, uh, I've summarized that story also in this book. Okay. Um, so there is a, a passage going back to where you talk about uh, that. You say, uh, when you're talking about one of the books that C.P. Brown put together, which is his uh, uh, cyclic tables of uh, where he calculates how time is measured and so on, you make an observation that says, uh, that South Indians had an acute, especially school children, had an acute understanding of an immediate short period, um, without, however, connecting that slice of time to earlier periods. Um, and this is uh, something that necessitated the creation of those. They didn't have almanacs. They didn't have uh, that sort of a system. Can Can you tell us more about that? 
Yeah, well, this, you know, this, this remark is what I was uh, I make. I'm quoting uh, Brown. So, uh, so in addition to what he did on Vemana, Brown had this study also of the different calendars that Indians were using at that time. And he found that in some schools in, in Madras, uh, he found that the boys, uh, I suppose, they, I think at that time, they were mostly boys in the school, uh, uh, were reciting uh, dates. Uh, month-wise, uh, and they went back to two or three years, the calendar was different. So, so they were reciting these, uh, 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 some kind of a three-year calendar they were, they were reciting and memorizing and reciting. Uh, and so, um, so this was a practice because the, the, the other Gregorian calendar, uh, other calendars had, had yet to become normal, normal in India. And, and so uh, this is what, uh, le leads me also to I, I make this extension from Brown's discovery that the ch children were reciting this very short-term calendars. Uh, but uh, in so many cases, you know, the dates of documents, the dates of historical events were not quite recorded in terms of the, each year, when did it happen. It takes a lot of research to discover from various kinds of calendars, various other inscriptions to exactly pin down the year. So. Yes, so I suppose one could, one, this is more, more, a, more a kind of uh, a, a deduction that I make, which may or may not be fully justified, that there is this very strong attachment to the immediate past, but a forgetfulness about a more distant past. I, I think we might see that in the kind of questions that are coming up, because a lot of them uh, deal with the immediate past. Is, is that something? Uh, that you want, uh, Dr. Vijay, do you want to? Um, I, I have a couple of um, uh, queries, uh, which I was very keen to uh, get clarification from uh, Professor Gandhi. Uh, sir, um, you uh, posit, I think early in the preface, you mentioned that there was never a political entity called uh, South India, but there was a cultural and uh, geo geographical as well as geopolitical entity. Um, can we extend that same definition to India as a, as a whole? That there was never a political entity called India, but there was a cultural and uh, geographical and geopolitical entity. Yeah, I think possibly that is, yes, that, that, that could be said. Uh, of course, there were times when much of India, if not all of India, was under one political ruler. Uh, these were not constant times in our old history. These, these were relatively short periods if you look at history as a whole. But there were times when much of India uh, was under one political rule. Uh, so that did not happen in South India quite that way. So there was no South Indian ruler the way there was Ashoka or Akbar for much of India. Yes, there, there was uh, the Vijayanagara Kingdom for a short, very short time. Uh, there was the Nizam of Hyderabad. There was Tipu for some time. Uh, there was the uh, Travancore ruler in Kerala. There was the Nawab of Arcot in his part. But I'm, I'm now talking about 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. There was no ruler for South India as a whole. And also, um, I was wondering if um, uh, the concept of uh, you know, something like cultural nationalism, as you seem to suggest, which binds the entire South India together in a way, you know, recognizable as South India. Uh, would that, uh, in a way, conflict with uh, political nationalism? Uh, here, and let me again underline, uh, I'm not propounding any theories or strategies here in this book. Yeah. Uh, I'm recording what happened. But yes, there's no doubt that uh, there is a cultural affinity amongst South Indians. I don't know whether one can uh, extend that uh, and call it cultural nationalism. I don't think I, I use that phrase at all. Uh, but and I also point out actually towards the end of uh, my book that this lack of real uh, connection with the immediate neighbor mm. uh, also extends you know, to other parts of India, in both, in both directions. So, uh, uh, but, but I think there is the fact that you are neighbors, uh, you know, it could lead to political alliances, it could lead to solidarity, it could be very useful solidarity for India as a whole. 
And if there are some, at, at, at times, some uh, un, unpleasant, unwelcome trends coming from the rest of India, one would want South to, the South to resist and overcome and produce uh, uh, more healthy trends. Mm. So, uh, so yes, I would, in short, to sum up, I think neighborliness, friendship towards neighbors can also be a very good political instrument. Mm. I, I think, we, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You, there is a, you quote uh, Balamani Amma in uh, one of the, uh, an image from uh, one of Balamani Amma's uh, thick, yeah. uh, writings where she talks about Kerala being turned away from yeah. the rest yeah. of India. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, this again is utterly fascinating. You know, Kerala is in so many ways uh, distinct in South India as a whole, distinct from its uh, South Indian neighbors. And, you know, the ocean to the, the, to the west and then the mountains to the east makes Kerala, you know, physically also somewhat isolated, uh, apart from some passes. And, and then uh, centuries and centuries of trade uh, with the Western world, with the Arab world, uh, also gives a distinct uh, flavor uh, to, to, to Kerala. And so, uh, yes, uh, uh, Kerala was a part of South India, part of India, but it was also economically, commercially, culturally a part of a wider world. Sir, um, extending that uh, question about uh, political nationalism, uh, if the entire South India has one distinct cultural identity, uh, would, you, would you say that uh, the uh, linguistic division of states based on language, do you think that was, that was um, if not uh, wrong, a kind of a short-sighted uh, policy? Um. So you know, there again, uh, I'm a chronicler of events. I'm being asked to make some kind of ju <laughs> judgments about what others did or did not do. However, I, I'll say this, that, uh, that no, I would say that uh, the linguistic uh, redistribution of states or uh, to put it slightly differently, the fact that people finally had a government that was managing its affairs in the language of the people was a wonderful democratic step for people. Uh, I think it made a huge difference uh, in, in the Telugu area, Kannada area, Tamil area, Malayalam area. It made a huge difference that people who spoke a particular language, of course there were others also who spoke different languages in the same area, but nonetheless the vast majority of people in a linguistic area were able to have a state where the government conducted its affairs in the language that they were using all day. It was a wonderful democratic achievement. It was, a, it was an act of progress, so the linguistic redistribution of states was not, in my assessment, a negative development. But what was a great weakness was that love of one's language, love of one's linguistic state was then accompanied by some kind of not so pleasant feelings about neighboring states. Cool. So this is where the mistake lay, not in the creation of linguistic states, but in the failure to extend uh, this kind of loyalty, enthusiasm, which you had naturally had for your own linguistic group, to your neighboring area. Yes, they spoke another language, but this language also bore an affinity with yours. There was the, it had the same Dravidian linguistic roots. So, so the, there was the cultural factor, the linguistic factor, but there was something more than that, which I mentioned here and there. You know, some people in the southern part of India were able to articulate a long time ago, much before the period I was studying, the idea of a common humanity. You know, Valuva does it, and Vemana does it, and Basava did it, uh, and, and others, uh, Sri uh, Narayana Guru did it. So different uh, remarkable people in the South at different times articulated the idea that all of us are one. This notion of an equal and common humanity, I, I, it wasn't very actively pursued, but it was articulated by some outstanding people in different parts of South India. So. Uh, the fact that they have a common linguistic origin, the fact that they are culturally similar, they're geographically in one place, and some of their best thinkers have articulated this wonderful notion of equality and a common humanity gives South India a special responsibility today. Uh, responsibility is a, a pretty heavy, uh, <laughs> uh, and I think uh, quite a quite a onerous job that you are asking South India. Oh, it no. is not I. It is your your tradition that is asking this of all of you. I mean, and all of you are remarkable people. 
but but I think something that you mentioned also answers one of the questions uh, that was asked about how um, uh, linguistic chauvinism, which is very often associated with uh, modern nation state, in particularly as we have inherited it from the West, from European, uh, uh, you know, uh, formation of nations in the 19th century. Um, by by making the linguistic states, are we in a way imitating that model of uh, of uh, associating one language with one particular geographical area? In a particularly in a country like India, which has always been multilingual uh, space. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I no. I think that the weakness that India does experience, the lack of you might say real solidarity across uh, towards our neighbor. I, that lack of solidarity, that lack of uh, deep involvement in the neighbor's affairs is not connected to the fact that there are linguistic states. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I think linguistic states, to repeat, have made de democracy more real for a great number of people. It should be welcome. And so, uh, but I think simultaneously we could, uh, all of you, uh, all of you, all of us, could work to, to, to create that affinity, that solidarity uh, at a more human level. And uh, that, uh, that uh, brings me to one of the questions uh, that uh, the, one of the audience, members of the audience has asked. This is uh, Sharada who is asking the question, uh, the Tamils prefer to dissociate themselves with the Sanskrit school. They would prefer to be unique. Is this true and is it possible? Uh, you know that even even we all know we all know that the leaders of the Dravida movement have some Sanskrit names, you know, Karunani, <laughs> Ramaswamy. So, uh, but the fact that there ha that Sanskrit also has entered into all the South Indian languages is a very important historical linguistic fact which should be recognized and there's no point is that neither logic nor any wisdom in, in <laughs> resenting uh, or, or disagreeing with this fact but at the same time uh, i don't i think we should recognize this is the important thing that we should recognize that in so many cases sanskrit has been linked also to Brahmins, although, as was pointed out, some of the great Tamil scholars were non-Brahmins. But at the same time, there is this linkage between Brahminism and Sanskrit, and linkage between Sanskrit and therefore the, the oppression that undoubtedly has taken place, the neglect and worse of, of the so-called lower castes and the so-called untouchables, has been a very big reality. And because some of the ancient Hindu texts um, were in, in, in Sanskrit language. Um, and because certain castes and classes were forbidden even from reciting those texts. So there was in the minds of some, of many, an association, identification of Sanskrit with some kind of uh, hierarchy or even oppression. And so I think uh, if some people therefore are not so enthusiastic about the Sanskrit elements of South Indian languages, that should be understood in the context that I have described. Uh, that, re that reminds me of your uh, uh, reference to uh, Ochendu Menon's Indulekha, yes. uh, where you talk about how a Nair girl uh, yeah. masters Sanskrit as a kind yeah. of a slap in the face of uh, the Nambudris. Right. Uh, right. And, yeah. and uh, this brings me back to uh, one of the issues that uh, Adiraj mentioned about how kind of a methodological question. Uh, yeah. you, were writing, you were writing a book on history, but uh, you devote at least, I think, three to four chapters also on, not necessarily chapters, but also you uh, bring in biographies, uh, you know, short sketches of biographies of uh, several people. Yeah. And yeah. also you uh, take... Uh, literature as sources. So please tell us about, uh, you know, your, uh, your idea of uh, the methodology of history. Yes, you know, there, there again, uh, 
I don't subscribe to any theory of my methodology. You know, long time ago when I was trying to write something, people asked me, which school do I belong to? Well, I did not belong to any particular historical school. My aim, I knew that it could never be realized adequately, but my aim, aim was to try and understand what was happening and to report it as faithfully as I could. Now, uh, and it, but it, you mentioned Gurja Dapparav, and I think I, I want to, to quote this because this is a very, one of the most important uh, lines for me. Uh, this is from Gurja Dapparav, which many of you are familiar with, and I'm going to give you the English translation. The English translation is by the well-known poet Sri Sri. Hmm. And the lines are these. Never does land mean clay and sand. The people, the people, they are the land. To repeat. Never does land mean clay and sand. The people, the people, they are the land. This is Gurjada Pura. Now, so in my attempt to understand 400 years of South Indian history, I wanted to understand the stories of the people. Now, the people I studied, were a random selection in a way, an accidental selection of those that I already knew something about, those that I happened to study, those that some people that I happened to meet were knowledgeable about, those whose stories seemed very interesting to me. Uh, but above all, I tried to write about people. That is why parts of my book appear biographical. Uh, but I've tried to cover a variety of people. And mind you, my selection is very arbitrary. It's very accidental. It's very personal. And there's so many, so many amazing people that are not in the story. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the millions and millions of unknown people whose stories are so profound and who are not in this book. So this is every history, every selection of people for a history is an arbitrary, personal, subjective selection. Uh, I do not say that my selection conformed to any rules of, or method, methodology of history. But yes, I wanted my history to be a history of people. So th that is very much uh, was my approach. Yeah, you I think, say, yes, Adirat, sorry. go ahead. You, you say somewhere in the book that uh, you, you cite C.R. Reddy, Katamanji Ramalinga Reddy, and you say that he uh, thought that the greatest Telugu before uh, that uh, in the time period before him was uh, Kandukuri Virasalingam. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in, in your study of the last 400 years, I mean, not to put a label on things, who do you think was the most, uh, um, who, who do you think that description would be appropriate for? You know, you know this is, uh, I, did, I did quote uh, Sia Reddy on Viresha Lingam as the most outstanding uh, Telugu person. But, you know, that is not a question I've even asked. And I feel it's not a question that even anyone should ask. You know, one great uh, simple rule that we, we can uh, perhaps apply with, with great uh, constructive results is to appreciate, not to compare. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate. Uh, uh, so uh, CR was fantastic, Periyar was fantastic. Uh, why should anyone have a, you know, argument who was more effective? We can, somebody can say, yes, these were CR's effect, defects, these were CR's good point, these were Periyar's achievement, these were Periyar's weaknesses. That is legitimate. We should understand the strengths and weaknesses of every character, important or unimportant. But to try and decide who was the GOAT, the greatest of all time, uh, or the greatest of 400 years, I think it is a, uh, a fruitless exercise and a completely uh, it's not a constructive exercise. At least this is how I look at it. Uh, let, let me rephrase. Most interesting character then. Um, <laughs> not, not the most, uh, the greatest. Uh, this is a very, you know, I, you know how it is. You have children and you spend different times with different children and you like them at different times. All my characters, I have absolutely loved getting to know them. Uh, even the non-Indian characters are, are fascinating to me in their own way, and everyone has, has their weaknesses. But uh, I mean, there are hundreds of characters. And uh, so, uh, you know, so, I mean, Kamaraj is a fascinating character. NTR is a fascinating character. Even Sanjeeva Reddy who's not, you know, is, uh, I know in Telangana, I mean, 
you know, he may or may not be always liked so much, but uh, uh, EMS uh, and these, uh, the, and that uh, incredible Nambudri reformer whose name I'm forgetting for the moment, incredible man uh, whom, whom I write about uh, before EMS, a very remarkable man who tried to create a commune of equality, incredible man who, who uh, another interesting person. He, he got expelled for intercaste uh, marriage. Is that the person you're talking about? Well, there were many who were expelled for intercaste, but he, yes, he, he, he had this, uh, uh, he has a very wonderful long name. V I, VT. That's it. That's it. Nambudri Pal. No, not Nambudri Pal. No, 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 no. Yeah, but uh, you see. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, since, uh, you know, you mentioned that all um, selection of uh, individuals is all eventually, ultimately uh, arbitrary. Uh, yeah. What about places? Uh, that also, that also is, is arbitrary. So, so many are neglected. I agree. Sadly, 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 sadly. Uh, I, and, you know, I greatly hope that if my book does nothing else but inspire some people, ah, this area is not studied, I'm going to write about it. This person is not. I'm, so there's so many angles to South India that are not covered in this book. So it'll be fantastic if more people take on some more areas, more people, more issues. Sir, is that because, as some people have uh, alleged, is that because you have taken um, the Madras presidency as the reference point for South India rather than, let's say, the Deccan as, as a reference point for South India? Uh, yes, I, I suppose I could have started elsewhere. But uh, my basic, uh, you know, every, here again, uh, no one's approach is ideal, but some approaches are more natural for some than other approaches. And my basic thinking was like this, that I don't, I don't want to go into the Vijayanagara story because that is, ends in 1565, essentially. Uh, I want to uh, cover South India as it developed after the European advent, although the Portuguese came before uh, 1565. So, uh, it's essentially the European advent, you know, my first chapter is called <clears throat> Sales on the Horizon, mm. Sales on the Horizon. And I make this point that North India uh, encountered foreigners through horses, mm. South India encountered foreigners through ships. And so it is the encounter with the Western world that sets the stage for my, my story. And that from with that angle, it is the uh, start of the uh, Fort St. George in Madras in 1639, which becomes an important date. Yes. And um, uh, again, uh, a, a slightly uh, kind of a methodological question. Uh, how does one, because there are two ways of uh, uh, looking into the past and understanding it. One is to look at the past as it happened, uh, you know, history as history. But second is to look at history from today's perspective. Uh, because after all, today's perspective is the only perspective that we have. So how should one approach history as a way of knowing our past? Uh, I think, you know, we are interested in the past for a variety of reasons. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't quite explain but people are deeply, deeply interested. And of course, there are also the political uses of history. Mm. And sometimes you might say the political abuses of history, the political misuse of history. Uh, so it's, you know, for those who want to affect today's situation, every weapon is useful. So mm. try, let's try and make history also part of our armory in dealing with today's situation. But I would say, a, and again, let me say that no, no one's history can be regarded as completely objective or completely free of some, some element of sympathy or lack of sympathy or affinity, lack of affinity. So there is a subjectivity in anyone's history. But to the extent one can, one should make, I think a true historian should make a real attempt to find out what happened, if possible, to find out how it happened, if possible, to find out why it happened, 
but I think it would be a wrong thing to say, oh, it should have happened in this particular way. Mm. And therefore I will identify some villains who prevented it from happening in a particular way. I think that is an error. Uh, I, I, I don't want to find people who enable the British to come mm. or, or whatever. They came. They did some terrible things. They did some wonderful things. Mm. Then all kinds of other people came and rose to the fore. Some of them did wonderful things. Some of them did mistaken things. So I want to the extent possible uh, to discover what happened how it happened, why it happened. Great. Uh, uh, Adiraj, any final uh, comments that you want to make? Uh, no, but I, I want to thank uh, once again uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Rajman Gambi and uh, HLF for this, uh, organizing mm -hmm. this and for the book. Uh, sir, uh, I'll uh, these are uh, I have received many uh, comments in the chat box, but uh, very few of them are actual questions, and uh, some of them are actually have already been answered by you. Because, uh, for instance, uh, one of them asks, uh, "What since you said it has to be people's history? What is the uh, parameter? What are the parameters for choosing the people that you want to work on?" Which I think you have already answered, saying that uh, all choices are uh, arbitrary. And, uh, and uh, but there is also one question interesting about, uh, since you said uh, uh, the linguistic states is a good idea, it's a you know, pr part of the democratization process, but very often, for example, um, in the Nizam's uh, dominion, uh, although the people's language was perhaps Telugu, uh, the question was, uh, what kind of encouragement or what kind of uh, uh, respect that was given to the Telugu language? So During the Nizam's time? Yes, sir. No, obviously it was not. I mean, uh, Telugu was neglected. So one great reason for the popular movement in, in Hyderabad was the fact that Telugu was not recognized, was not, you know, so that was, a, it was a very important factor. So Telugu was, it was and. Yeah, any other uh, example that you can give us, uh, for example, where, which um, gives us that the rulers may, be, uh, uh, may belong to one particular language, but they encouraged uh, other yeah, languages. Well, well, the Qutub Shahi rulers of uh, Hyderabad were very much like that. Right. They, they, they learned Telugu and they, they, they used the Telugu language. And even the Asif Jai ones uh, differed from one another. So I'm not saying that all of them were hostile to hmm. Telugu. But certainly during the last Nizam's rule, the Telugu was not greatly encouraged. That, that's a fact. But the earlier, and this is true in elsewhere too. I think many, many rulers, many uh, princely rulers at times showed uh, great, uh, had some democratic instincts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, with that, we uh, would uh, like to thank once again, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. Sir, thank you very much for readily thank agreeing you. to do this session for us. And um, we had about 105 uh, people who were watching this. And I once again apologize for our inability to uh, broadcast it live on YouTube. I'm sure some of them may have gone there and uh, found nothing was happening there. And probably some of them may have come back to this uh, you know, session, but uh, some of them may have just dropped off uh, because they were uh, disappointed. I once again apologize for that and uh, thank you once again, sir. And uh, thank you, Adiraj, uh, for this session. Well, thank you for giving me this chance. I enjoyed very much being with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, audience. Once again, uh, let me uh, remind everyone that our next session will be on 10th of July. And uh, the session will have the writer Tabish Khair in conversation with Giridhar Rao. Uh, of course, we will send you the information, uh, but do join us once again uh, on 10th Ju July, same time, 7 p.m. And so uh, with this, I, on behalf of my colleagues, Ajay Gandhi, Amita Desai, and uh, Kinnara Murthy, and the entire HLF team, I thank you once again for joining us this evening. And I once again thank both Adiraj and Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir.